good evening, good morning, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for joining us for the Secret to Success podcast. Today, we have the wonderful Mr. Bill Woodich with us. So I am going to end my conversation here and let Mr. Bill tell us all about him. So Mr. Bill, if you'll give us some, some more information about you, what got you started, and how everything is going for you today. What a great opening question. What a great opening question. First of all, I want to tell you, uh, I want to say thank you for, for allowing me to be on your show. You have a great platform, a great podcast, and I'm really humbled and honored to be on it. You know, you know, for, for me, um, it's, it, going back through the, the lens of time, I started in a really small town in western Pennsylvania. There were only 3,500 people in that town. It was the middle of a forest. So the two things you could do is, A, go to work in a local factory, or if you were maybe had parents that kicked you a little harder and you really wanted to go to school, maybe you could go on to college. Well, I got kicked but I didn't want to go to school. Just, you know, Deanna, I just didn't want to go to school. So I went to work in a factory. And after seven to eight months in a factory, I learned that, well, maybe I should have probably tried a little harder because I didn't want to do the same thing every day that I was doing. That was just cutting three holes in a piece of wood every day. Bottom line is in your life, in my life, someone's going to give you a shot. When they give you that shot, you got to take it with everything you have. My parents gave me that shot. They said, if you mess this up, we're going to give you a shot to go to school. You got to take out loans. At the time, they weren't anywhere near where they are today. But we're going to give you a shot. If you mess it up, you're going back to work in that factory. So the factory wasn't a place to me. It was just a more of an environment in my mind where I just couldn't do anything else. You know, and I'm a creative. So I wanted to be creative. I couldn't do it. So I went to school, um, worked really hard. Got my first job in sales. Didn't really want to be in, in sales, but I had to put food on the table. Got my first job, and I just kept, just kept at it until I did really well with it. Became the number one salesperson at a very big company. And then was recruited by another one and became their top salesperson. And then I thought, you know what? I'm going to do the toughest thing I ever did. I'm going to really see how good I am. And I started my own company. And... 27 years later, it's the best move I ever made. That's a, that's a real quick short story right there. Wow. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Because it when you said I'm a creative, I couldn't create just drilling three holes in a piece of wood. My heart went out to you. <laughs> because the, the, I understand that when you're in a position where it's like, okay, I, I, there is no way I can be me here. There is no way that I can let all this creativity in my brain out. So when you said that, I was like, oh, I'm not the only one, yay. <laughs> no, and what you just said right there is crucial for anyone that's listening that wants to move ahead. You've got to know who you are, what you really want, and for us, it's being creative, get out of the box, and then you have to know what it is you're willing to endure and give up to get it. You, you just nailed it, right? We're together on that. Let's be creative together. Definitely. And, and I love it. So Woodage Enterprises, you said 27 years ago, you said, I'm going to really challenge myself <laughs> and start and, and, <laughs> and work and, and do me. What, what drove you to just, just after, after a while of being in sales and being in corporate first, how did you get past that first hump of getting the first sale? You know what? I tried for 13 times to get that first sale. And every time I tried, I failed. And I tried because I was doing things that weren't comfortable for me. And it wasn't selling. You know, it was, here's a brochure. Tell them who you are and how big we are. And it had nothing to do with the client or with that person. So you know what I did? I, I started leaving all that stuff in my car. And I started to meet people as people. I started to win hearts and minds, not everyone, but a lot, just by being me. And it worked really well. You know, authenticity, it's rare. And when you come at it from a place of, I'm not the biggest, not the best at this, really don't do that well, people start to listen. But what is it that you do well? Now they're paying attention, which is the first thing you need to do in any type of sale. 
Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, one of the, I tell people all the time, I'm not a salesperson. I literally, with every passion in me, hate sales. <laughs> <laughs> but what I can do is I can have a conversation with you. And that is the highest level of sales. What I call that is enrollment, enrolling a person, enrolling them. And I, you know, the word sales, I'm, the, I'm with you on this. When you mention that to me, I would get, you know, I would almost break out because I said, oh, it just reminds me of bad things. I don't want to be a salesperson. That's the last thing I ever want to do. And then when I, when I got into it, I learned, like you said, it's about a conversation. It's about a relationship. And that's totally different than trying to sell somebody something, you know, enroll them, make friends. Yes. Yes. And a lot of the, the members of Antonio's um, university are there because of conversation. Well, the greatest thing that Antonio ever taught me was conversations create clients. He said, all you have to do, like you said before, is be authentic and be yourself. Yes. And, and when I started just being myself, putting me on, on everything instead of going by the script, instead of, yes. you know, just shoving something in their face, just having, so how are you today? It, it just, it became, it was more natural for me to just have a, yes. a genuine conversation with someone than it was to be like, so this is what we have. Right. You're right. And you know what I learned later that you're doing now? You, you learned this much younger than me. But I learned that by asking those how questions, that uncertainty level that people are still trying to think, you know, are you a friend, a foe, an ally? They don't know. But they start talking about themselves. And that opens them up to talking about you and learning about you. If you just throw up on them with words, it's probably going to shut you down. Completely. Just because I do it. If someone yeah. comes at me and says, hey, so this is what I'm like. Wait, no, no, no. <laughs> I love it. No, I appreciate yeah. it. I, yeah, you no, know, that doesn't work for me. Well, but you know, I said, I don't even have a need for it. But you didn't talk to me enough to even what, know if I needed it. Right. And see what you just said? You just said, because I do it. And if you ask yourself this question, if your listeners ask yourself this one question, how would I like to be sold? You don't want to be sold. You want to be enrolled. You want to have a relationship, somebody that's caring. Because people will will they want to know really they want to know that you care about them before they ever care about what you know and i think i love what you're saying with that because we're very similar in that same type of philosophy yes sir it, it took once once i got there once i got over the fear of the first phone call <laughs> it and then once i got became authentic and actually had a conversation it became it became more of building a friendship and a relationship than trying to sell them something. And so it just made that process a lot easier. And, and so speaking of fear, you started your company 27 years ago, and you are still up and running prosperous, prosperous, running, prosperous and running strong till today. Can you let us know how was that process and what, what actually drove you to say, you know what, I'm going to take a chance on me. I'm going to move and do me. Here's what I would recommend that everyone that's listening think about. Do you want to live a life of regret? And that means, that means this. Can you do those things now that you may not be able to do later? How important is that to you? So for me, working in big companies, I wanted to see how good I was doing it on my own and didn't want to have regret. That was a huge motivator for me. Now, you don't survive 27 years and thrive in most of them unless you change. So you have to change and see people fear change. They don't want to change things. They think things are good enough. And when you think that, you're going to go backward. So I have been able to change. I know that I'm not the smartest, the best in the room. I hire people that are much brighter than me, much more capable than me, and let them get engaged to make a difference in their lives. And by doing that, they make a difference in mine. So that process of putting people first has really been the biggest difference maker for me. Thank you so much. That was, I have learned by listening to those who have 
been successful in their own business is that your business is nothing without the people. It's absolutely nothing, nothing without the people. You can't, your, your consumers, your audience, your, the, the, those who, your team members, it's nothing without them. So thank you for letting our audience know that, ladies and gentlemen, you, you can't build a company without people. You can't, and don't even think of them as people, think of them as team members. Yes, huge. Because, and that, that mindset that you just mentioned, team members, and I, I go as far as to say co-workers, not employees. So I really, really go that far. And I think we're all in it together. We're all equal in there together. We're all have, we all have to pull. And I don't, they don't work for me. We work together. I work with them. They work with me. And that's a huge mindset shift. And, and that's one that I, I learned early. So what other mind, mindset shifts did you learn in order to continue to run a prosperous company for 27 years? First thing is that if it's to be, it's up to you. And I mean that with everyone taking personal accountability for the result. And that's the biggest thing you have. When you look in the mirror every day, what you have to see is what do I need to do to improve? So I think if it's to be, it's up to you means that I'm going to own that result. Do I have to have more activity? Do I have to have a different form of activity? Can I change? Can I learn from the greats? Can I, what do they do? Success will leave clues. What do I have to do to improve every day? That's the number one mindset is self-improvement by, by saying, if it's to be, it's up to me and living that. That's, that's number one mindset for me. Number one. You want to know number two? Yes, I do. All right. This is for relationships of any kind, whether it's dating, whether it's whatever it is, never give away your self-respect. Never. That's the one thing people will take. You can't, you, they can take it. They can't take anything from you that you don't give when it comes to attitude and respect. You give that away, they're going to walk over you. So you have to have what I call W-A-P, walk away power. And if you're in a bad negotiation, bad bargain, bad relationship, and you're like a doormat, you got to be able to walk away from a bad position. That was my second mindset. Okay. I'm so happy you mentioned WAP. I'm so happy you mentioned it. <laughs> so can you go into more detail about WAP and how it, it helps not only in relationships, but avoiding bad business deals, uh, how making good business deals, even when it comes to hiring your in, hiring your team members, hiring your coworkers, yeah. how does a WAP method work? It's one of the great segue questions that I've been asked, and I've been doing this for a long time. So that, thank you for asking that question. Here's what I've learned in selling the relationships, whatever it is: fear, desperation, and greed. People can smell on you. They maybe feel sorry for you, but they really don't want to partner with you. So if you have a fear that you're going to be left alone on a Saturday night. As guys, so much of your identity is wrapped up in your hair. From how it feels after getting a fresh cut to the way it per is perfectly styled before going out. That's why when you get into your 20s and your 30s and start noticing the first signs of hair loss, it definitely feels like panic time. Because let's face it, no guy is ever ready to go bald. Thankfully, now there's keeps the simple and easy way to keep your hair. You used to have to go to the doctor's office for your hair loss prescription. Now, thanks to Keeps, you can visit a doctor online and get your hair loss medication delivered right to your home. They make it easy and deliver your medication every three months so you can say goodbye to pharmacy checkout lines and awkward doctor visits. Find out why Keeps has more five-star reviews than any of its competitors and more than 100,000 men trust Keeps for their hair loss prevention medication. Keeps' treatments start at just $10 per month. Plus, for a limited time, you get your first month free. So if you're ready to take action and prevent hair loss, go to keeps.com slash Antonio to receive your first month of treatment for free. That's K-E-E-P-S dot com slash Antonio. Again, keeps.com slash Antonio. You might make bad choices. You, you might want to say, you know, this is, a, I just don't want to be alone. So my big fear, what am I doing with that fear? Am I making it worse? 
by choosing someone that's available because I'm maybe in a desperate state, it's the same in business. If you don't have enough calls, if you don't have enough activity, if you don't have enough prospects, you're going to be full of fear. I've got to make every sale. You're going to lose money. You're going to drop your price. You're going to give them terms you can't meet. You have, you're desperate. Oh, what am I going to do? It's the same thing in relationships where you need to be in a value place where you're valued and the client is valuing you, you're valuing them. The other person is dealing with you as a person, not a concept, a person, not a concept. Walk away power simply means this. He or she who cares least controls most. Now in relationships, you don't want, you don't want to be controlled, but you want to work together against the rest of the environment that's trying to do something, maybe force you into a, uh, a situation where you're desperate or maybe put you over here where you kind of feel a little bit of fear. Together, that power of two overcomes one. That's what I believe. That is, okay. You said something that I don't know why, but it just hit me. You said, think of people as a person not a concept. I've never heard it put that way before, but I completely understood it. And it just, it clicked something for me. Cause like you said, when you, when you, when you fear something, you go, you make the wrong kinds of decisions. So if you're in fear of making the sale, you're viewing that person as a sale instead of a person. And that's what will drive you to not have the conversation but to try to close the sale. Thank you. <laughs> you, you. You know, you would actually interpret me better than I interpret myself. <laughs> and, 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 and so you, you've heard it this way. Do you have an abundance mentality, which I do, or do you have a scarcity mentality? See, my, my way is abundance. I'm gonna share ideas. I'm not, I don't expect to get paid for that stuff. I give away more for free. That's great. If someone can take it and make it, it's their thing. Scarcity means I got to make every sale. If I don't make the sale, if I don't take this off the table, you're going to get it. There's enough for all of us if we live with abundance. And that is, see, fear less is abundance. Scarcity is total fear and desperation and greed. That's scarcity. You don't want to live in scarcity. You want to walk away from scarcity by making the activity, owning the result. If it's to be, it's up to me. And that's how you're free. And everything to me is working toward your freedom. Everything. Wow, this is awesome! I'm truly enjoying my interview with you today. <laughs> oh, you're you're great! To be, you're great to go uh, conversation. You're fantastic. I love it. <laughs> Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I truly, I really hope you are taking notes. There's a reason why this is called Secret to Success, and Mr. Bill, Mr. Bill Woodish said it earlier. Success has its own language, and he has been speaking it this entire time especially when you said you have a mentality of abundance versus a mentality of scarcity. Antonio, when he talks to us, he said, you either fighting for poverty or prosperity. So you want abundance or you want poverty. Every time he says that to us, we're looking at him like, man, we want prosperity. <laughs> we are not. Right. It, and another way that he puts it to us that makes it for all of us, it just, he says, grass does not fight to grow. Great one. Why are you fighting for something that's already meant for you? Why are you fighting for your abundance? It's enough for everybody. Yes. But spot on. We're very much in alignment with, with our thinking. Very much. And, and because he's taught me that when I'm, when I'm speaking to others, I love hearing abundance. So, it, so explain to us how your mentality of abundance has helped you your the the entire time you have from the moment you've decided you know what there's nothing that i don't have to fight for anything i don't have to fear anything I, there is no scarcity to the moment you said abund there's abundance everywhere so i'm just going to i'm just going to just go with it what was that process for you like and how has that um, how have you applied that to your business and to your life to get you to the abundance that you are in today the one thing that growth growth needs it's a requisite for growth is consistency so with with me what i learned is this i wasn't going to provide 
X amount of value for a client if they didn't pay me X amount of money. And a lot of people in my company did. They said, they don't pay us enough to do this. We're not going to do that. Oh, they pay us a lot, so we're going to do this. I gave the same service to the people who paid a little bit to the ones who gave a lot. And that was my mindset of treating a person as a person, not a concept, not by the size of their wallet, but, but what I knew was in my heart, my servant heart to do. And I, I led my life with that design and process in mind. And it created tremendous opportunities because people would say, why do you give it away? I gave it away so people could grow, find the environment for them to find something of value. But in the meantime, I became happy and got a lot more clients from doing everything I said and doing everything consistently at a very, very high level, regardless of how much you pay. Oh, um, consistency, that is one of the greatest on this journey <laughs> that I have learned so much. And one of the greatest things that have really just, it, at first it was hard for me to grasp was the consistency. You can't, you can't say, oh, I'm gonna read this book. Okay, yeah. I got everything down in this book. I'm great now. I'm, I'm, I'm better on my mindset. And then you like, and then you, you just stay there. It's a consistency of elevation. And when, when that actually triggered in my head, I was like, okay, you can't just, and what, uh, and our team, we call it pour into yourself. You can't just pour into yourself once a week and think you're gonna be okay. No, no, no. It's a consistency of this. You have to find something every day to pour into you. And so thank you for, for letting our audience know that there is a consistency for, in order to have any type of prosperity in life, not just in business, not just in your relationships, but there's a consistency of work, a consistency of changing your mindset. Um, I, if I remember correctly, can I think of his name? There's an author who wrote an amazing book, and I, I feel so horrible. I can't remember his name right now. But he said it's a it's a life <clears throat> it's a it's a a lifestyle. You mm -hmm. know, it's it's not just a oh I'm just gonna read this book. No, it's I'm going to read this book and apply this to my life to change right. my life. Right. So thank you so very much. What you just mentioned again, I'm as we go back and forth in conversation, I'm taking notes on some of the stuff you're saying that really sparks uh, that ember to flame inside of me. And you mentioned the word applied, you mentioned the word elevate, and I wanna marry those two words. Whatever consistent, consistency is this, you can read this on Instagram, you can read it on Facebook, you can read it on LinkedIn, you can read it anywhere, it sounds good. But unless you do the work and apply that lesson, apply it consistently every day, doing the work when you don't feel like doing it, when your nails are breaking, when it doesn't really matter, you're getting dirty, you're not gonna make it. That's true habit. Adopting those habits of excellence, you have, you have to apply what the message in the books or the people who are gurus are saying or implying. Number two, every day you gotta elevate because you get to a certain level, there's always a devil at the next level. So to keep moving, you gotta get more skills, you gotta get even more, you gotta get more you know, aligned with what your fears are. You're gonna meet your fears, you're gonna meet that devil at that next level, and you have to keep raising the bar by being prepared for whatever that bargain is that they demand. It's as simple as that. Oh, Mr. Bill, let me tell you. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about too. I know you do. <laughs> when I first started on this journey about, about five years ago, about five and a half years ago, I would, I was, I was, I was so, my ceiling was so high to reach that I didn't even realize I reached it. And now the more, Every day I find myself hitting a ceiling and pushing past it, hitting a ceiling and pushing past it, hitting a ceiling. And when the very first time I realized that I'd reached a ceiling, everything around me was like crazy. <laughs> everything was crazy. Relationship was crazy. Kid was crazy. Home life was crazy. Work was crazy. And I just sat down with that. I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm past whelmed. I'm overwhelmed at yeah. this point. And I told myself, and because 
and my business partner, uh, her name is Grace Sandals. Me and her, when we talk, I always say, and I was having a conversation with myself. And, <laughs> and in this particular conversation with myself, I said, okay, so either you're going to let this overwhelmed feeling destroy everything around you, or you're going to elevate to meet the challenge. And at that point, that's when I was like, I'm tired of the destruction. I want elevation. And at that point, I was like, okay, this is the ceiling. Let's push through that. Now let your ceiling become your floor and let's keep moving. Mm -hmm. And ever since then, it's been crazy because instead of them coming in the wide gaps, I'm noticing I'm hitting my ceiling a, a lot faster than I used to. And every time I get to a point now, every time I get to a point where I feel overwhelmed, I'm like, nope, you're not overwhelmed. You can do this. You just need to learn a new skill or you need to learn a new concept. You know what that mindset's called? Growth. It's called a growth mindset that you have. No, it is. <laughs> and it's that growth mindset is what will... They found out that that type of mindset, they found out over 20 years of Stanford research with this lady named Carol Dweck, that if you have, those with a growth mindset, at the end of the day, are more successful, even financially, than those who had a higher level of IQ. It's not the school you went to, it's not if you went to school, it's what do you, what's your common sense, street sense, can you navigate through life and build relationships? You know, again, people don't care about what you know, they care, they want to care, to know that you care about them. And you mentioned the word ceiling. You're getting there fast because you're doing those things every day. So compounded over a year, two years, think of how far you've grown by doing those small things every day. And success is not, it's a test every day. You know, it's not given out. It's not parceled out for free. It comes with sacrifice, man. You got to do the work. So what you're saying completely in alignment again what really did it for me mr Wittich, was when antonio promoted me to coo <laughs> there you go ultimate respect responsibility <laughs> oh <laughs> i went from researcher to assistant to executive assistant to coo and i'm sitting here and i'm like okay <laughs> and he told me one day he said things will get easier for you when you actually accept the position that I gave you because you earned it. And I sat back that day and I looked at him and I was like, hmm, you're right. And, and that's, yes, and that's the thing. You have to feel worthy and deserving of it. And others can see that, like he saw that in you. It's the hardest thing for us to see it. But then when you embrace it, you're like, okay, I own this. I got this. It <laughs> It's always harder. It's all, it, and, and the moment he told me that, I, and, the, and you're right, the moment I said, I can do this, that's when I pushed through that ceiling <laughs> and it became my floor. And see, you know what you're saying too, because this happened for me. People say, how did you go from selling to CEO of a company growing through the stages of manager to CEO? And I said, you have to develop different skills for each position. You have to be at that, you said, get to that ceiling, break through the ceiling with consistent, you know, habits. But one of those habits has to be keep growing your skills every day, every day. Definitely. And one of the, one of the things that Antonio taught us that you can't connect the dots going forward. You can <laughs> only connect the dots going backwards. And in learning that, I've also learned that when it comes to helping others go from employee to entrepreneur or employee to CEO, they have to make that mindset change. Because it took me, it took me years to even get the first dollar bill to flow through my company because of that very mindset. Because I was still in the mindset of an employee. Work from eight to five, do the research I needed to do, Get, the, get my client whatever they need to get, get them out the way. And then I'm free on the weekends. I don't work on the mm -hmm. weekends. After 5 p.m., don't call me. Before 8 a.m., don't call me. These are not my work hours. But now it's like I may not answer a phone after 10 p.m. during the week, 
but I will be <laughs> I will be responding to emails, finishing up right. a project, you know, sending out emails for the next morning, making sure I have the next day set up. It's a complete mindset shift. And for anybody out there who is a solopreneur or a parallelpreneur, make sure you do you don't just do the work on your company, do the work on your mindset. Because it'll hurt you and it'll it'll hurt you in the long run. I would do the do the work on the mindset first before you will ever be good to a company. So you have to really what you're saying is I'm glad you have boundaries. At least shut that thing down at 10 o'clock. At some point you have to, you'll lose your energy for the game. You don't want to shut <laughs> make, making sure you're not doing it 24 hours a day. It's not the way to do it. it. It's funny. It's funny how I actually got to that point. Yeah. Antonio texted me one evening and he normally he does it to the whole team, but he's actually, because he knows how, how his team is, he actually stopped sending out messages to us. Um, so, cause what he, what he used to do is he used to text us like, it may be cause he's as all majority CEO entrepreneurs really don't have a sleep schedule. <laughs> yeah. So he, if he's working on something, he'll text us or message us um, mm. assignments for the next day. And what he started noticing was we were actually responding back to him and he thought about it he said i hope you guys aren't responding to our clients and our customers this late as you are responding to me and then right after that he was he said stop doing it i'm not giving this to you to do it tonight i'm giving it to you for the next day so he told me he told me one day he said stop do not answer the phone for anybody after if it's work related and it's after a certain time do not do it he said my job as a ceo is to protect all of those that work with me you are coo i cannot have you tired you run the entire company so at a certain point i need you to cut your phone off and i looked at him i was a little shocked because <laughs> i'm I, at this point i've gotten so used to always being on the clock. I've, I've received text messages from our, 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 we call them our team members at two, one, 12, one, two o'clock in the morning. And I'm sitting here and I'm like, why is my phone going off? <laughs> and I, <laughs> and when I pick it up, I'm like, wait, why are you up? This early? And once he told me that he told me, he said, my job is to protect you. Your job is to run the company. I, you can't run the company if you're exhausted. And you have to set boundaries for everybody. That includes me. So at a certain time, turn off your phone. That is the greatest lesson yes. I have ever learned in my entire yeah. time of this entrepreneurial journey. Because we don't, we, because of that mindset, and even as an employee, sometimes depending on the type of employee you are, your mindset mm -hmm. is... I have to take work home to finish it or I have to come in early or I'm answering phones. I'm, I'm answering emails at one o'clock in the morning and getting responses. So I have to keep going. I can't miss anything. So even as an, I carry, I carry that very mindset from an employee over to COO and it, it almost took me out. And he told me, he said, no, no more. Now that is the essence of what I aspire to be in terms of servant leadership, because that's really showing true care and valuing your coworker as a leader. Servant leadership means I work for them, they don't work for me. I wanna pull them off of the engagement line if they're burning out, I wanna send them somewhere, I wanna get them off. I'm very careful of their mental and their now physical health. So I'm really, really careful with the employee first uh, mindset that I call coworker and I, People would say that's servant leadership, and that's what I do. So we, I relate to what he's saying. He's, he sounds like a great CEO. He he's awesome. He 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 is a CEO. But he is a CEO <laughs> that makes sure that we're all taken care of. You know, if he he calls it our work environment. He said if your work environment isn't somewhere where you enjoy coming to work, he said that falls on me, and I have to fix that because you have to enjoy it in order for the productivity of anything to be, you know, at high quality. So. Absolutely. 100%. So Mr. Wittich, 
I have a question. <laughs> you have a book called Fail More. Can you tell us about that and the importance of that very title, Fail More? You know, you walk through airports when you could walk through airports and go through airport bookstores or any bookstore, any place you see online, most books are about success. But what's missing from success books is the hard work, the other side of the coin, because success and failure are two sides of the same coin. But the other side, the part no one tells you about is failure. You have to learn to fail intelligently to ever become successful. Everything we've ever done, we've had to fail first. That's how you raise your ceiling. The ceiling you talk about that you move forward every day, you learned it by failing. You failed intelligently. You had fear, but you did it anyway. So the book is a how-to guide. What happens when you feel fear? What do you do in your mind? What do you write down? How do you take notes on it and journal it and, and connect the dots of how you felt? Because as you said, you can only go back with those dots to then project forward. What do I need to do to get through this? And then if you're in a position where you do fail, how do you, what's your mindset? What's your mindset? Then what's your activity? Do you withdraw from your dreams? Do you give up your dreams and hopes and aspirations? Or do you learn, this is the gold kill me. So the first thing your listeners need to do is every time they feel it, know the difference between danger and fear. See, fear is a protective part of danger, but danger is imminent threat from man, animal, or insect right? Any kind of insect. Now there's those big killer wasps coming over here or insect. But fear is mostly invisible. It's a future experience that appears to be real. So that's the focus of the book. Here's fear. What does it mean? Where did it come from? What can you do about it? Now here's failure. And not just a go out and run through a door, actual steps and process. Here's how you do it. Here's how you move forward. In a nutshell, there it is. All right. The fear, okay, I was that one fear. Fear, it used to stop me. It mm -hmm. literally used to stop me with Mr. Woodish. I would not move past anything. I would not move past any. Once that fear hit, I was like, oh no, I can't do that. I can't do that. But there's something you mentioned. You said, know the difference between fear. Mm -hmm and danger so can you go into more of that with us and, and if you even can give us an example of either one so that way we know okay this is fear that's danger don't do that push through this <laughs> the brain's primary job is to, is for us to survive to preserve itself so it tries to keep us safe so it runs on instinct a lot of the time so way back from our ancestors we thought there was a saber-toothed tiger out there somewhere. So that we equated as fear and danger. The fear was its anticipation. We're, we need to do something about it. But that was real danger. Our instinct today in the boardrooms, in the classrooms, in the offices, we still run on that same vein of instinct where we, we feel as if it's a saber-toothed tiger. And instead of making that phone call and getting hung up, we think the tiger is going to come through the door and kill us. It's not. The danger, danger is different. You're walking down an alleyway, it's, the, it's dark, that fear is protecting you. It's sending out warning signals that there could be danger. But when you're on the phone, in an office, talking with people, that is all self-consumed fear. It's invisible. It's an invisible barrier. And if you can't move through it, you will never go forward. So what you were feeling is what everyone feels, the fear of rejection, the fear of, oh, I don't want to put myself out there because if I do, uh, what? You get rejected, you don't want to get killed. So there's a huge difference in that. You need to know the difference between fear and danger before you ever go forward. They will kill you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was, thank you. Thank you. Because I, I used to, my thing used to be fear to me was danger. Oh, no, that's danger. Can't do that. that that's you know, what, you, you know what it's danger to? And this is the biggest thing ever. You know what the danger is to? Your ego. Because oh. see, the, the danger to the ego keeps people back because they don't want to be, oh, no, uh, uh, I just made a sale. I don't want to go out and try 10 times to make a new one because I am successful here. And see, every that's the biggest thing. It's your ego that's keeping you from it. I, I, I will, I, 
took me probably 27 years to figure that out. But what I did, the light went on and I changed a lot of the mindsets of people who were open to changing it because they thought, you know what, my ego is in the way. It's about me and feeling that uh, that hurts because it's personal. It's not personal. Get over it. Exactly. Get over it. And then you get that first win, so your ego is yeah. boosted, and you're like, oh, no, I'm not going to go back just for them to knock me off my high horse right now. I got right. this. <laughs> so there we go back to the whole thing about self-worth. You've got to build your self-worth internally. You've got to build it based on your internal word, not what other people from the outside think about you, say about you. Not that way. It's too, fr it's too fragile, and you're like a puppet. You want to master yourself. Do the work inside first. Wow. That, thank you. Cause <laughs> when you said ego, it, it, it clicked. Cause <laughs> it, it really clicked. Cause I, and Tony used to always tell us, yeah, you get that first, like, think about it. You got two cells in one day and you're like, yeah, I'm good. And you don't do anything mm -hmm. else for the rest of the week. Right. It combined with what you just said about ego and what he said, it made complete sense. To yeah. me. It's like, I don't want to get at this point. I'm the one who has the most sales today. Nobody else is gonna out. I I got, I got ten sales this week. I'm not about to. I'm not about to ruin that. <laughs> yeah, right. Because then you lose one, and everybody says, you know, she was good for a while, but then she just lost her last sale, and then now it's a bad weekend. Don't ride that wave, that emotional wave that others assigned to you. You create your own. Exactly. There's a book that um, in Antonio's leadership class. It's called Peaks and Valleys. And I've read that book so many times and every time I get something different out of it. And I just equated that book with sales. Sales are just like peaks and valleys. You have your peaks where you're up high, but then you have your valleys. If you prepare yourself, the more you prepare yourself in the valley of not having sales or not making enough phone calls, if you, if you push yourself to make more phone calls than the next person or push yourself to make more phone calls than you did the day before, when you hit that peak, you'll be riding high for a long time. <laughs> yeah. If I could just clip what you just said right there and play it for all salespeople, because that is the formula. You have to have the activity, a lot of activity. You reach that peak, you keep moving beyond. You can ride that for a while because that's called momentum. It's huge, huge. That's the way forward. And it's, it's absolutely amazing. So I have another question for you, Mr. Woodage. Right. How do you, you, you've pretty much said how you can leverage the fear. How do you accomplish anything by not doing everything? And then how do you know what it is that you need to do versus the stuff that you're like, okay, that's not priority, but this is what I need to do. Well, when I started, you're bringing me back to a place of, uh, I can still feel the frustration because I tried to do all things. And I, I think there's a saying that if you try to do all things for all people, you end up doing nothing for anyone. And I ended up trying to do everything in the company and I needed to because for it to survive, I had to be the person that was doing all of these different things, wearing all kinds of hats. And you can do that for a certain period of time. And then you start to burn out. You start to miss things. You start to not want to do things, and you actually hate the thing that's supposed to be serving you, your company. So I learned that you have to have earned trust. You have to hire people that can do, that are capable, that can work autonomously, that have the, the ability, the wherewithal, the intelligence, the street smarts to do things, and then you let them do them. You let them do them. Now, it doesn't mean you divorce yourself from the outcome. I'm calling them. I'm checking up on this. I'm making sure I'm doing all of that but they're doing those functions that are critical. They're very critical while I do other ones that are equally as critical, but in, in a different direction. So delegation is the key delegation to people who have the right stuff. That's, that's the thing right there. And they've got to want it as much as you do. Meaning you, I think you, just by talking with you, I think you run his business as if it was your own business. And that's the key. That's the key. Those are the kind of people you want to attract. I, I, t I tell you, Mr. Bill, Mr. Woodage, when, when he first gave me the COO position, I was like, what do I do? Because I'm, I'm still building mm -hmm. my company from how he's mentored and coached me. 
And I, I actually switch. That's what helped me. I switched my mindset, Diana. How would you run this business if it was yours? And that, and that's how. And once I got to that point, I was like, "You would stay up till two o'clock in the morning to make sure an assignment gets done. You wouldn't tell anybody you were up, (laughs) but you would make sure." Now I'm not working on getting you a raise, but I would tell you this. <laughs> that, that's the type of mindset that CEOs embrace, cherish, and value right there. And no one had to tell you that. You just get it. And that's the thing. So many people have to be told this, this, and this, and they only go to a certain point, nine to five, eight to five. And I always say that they shrink their lifestyle to meet the size of their paycheck instead of doing the work it takes to open up a bigger lifestyle. That's a simple thing. There it is. But there's your raise. <laughs> Thank <it>. you. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's another question that I want to ask you when it, um, to, to help other COOs and entrepreneurs out there. Mm-hmm. Because I know they're out there. There's a lot just like me who when we first start our company, it's our baby. Send them to me. <laughs> if, they're like, if they're like you, send them to me. <laughs> It's like they, when they first started, their company is their baby. It's their mm-hmm. heart. It's their mm-hmm. everything. They can't trust someone else to do it like they would do it. What would you tell them? I've been there. I've done that. And it is an evolution. Trust is something that is earned. Only the fool grants it. Trust must be earned through consistent performance not granted on a one-time event. So maybe that young entrepreneur has some people and they're getting into the mindset and how are they functioning without him or her watching? What's happening? Who can they give a little bit to? Now from a little bit, have they earned a little more trust and then a little more trust? That's how I did it, very small. Like the Ethiopian proverb is how do you eat an elephant? one bite at a time. You're not gonna do it overnight. You're not gonna trust your baby overnight. It's not gonna happen. But if your baby's able to grow, you know what they say about a, um, a shark in a fish tank will never grow beyond the fish tank. Put it in the ocean, gets to about 12 feet. You gotta be able to be in a position where you cultivate, track good people, people like I'm talking with right now, and put them in position where they can change the dynamic and make you bigger. Now, do not, do not grant it you make the people earn it and that's how you do it that's how i did it step by step small process but it is your baby you don't want to keep giving it up it's always, <laughs> going, it's always going to be your baby <laughs> what one of the things antonio he when he gave when he promoted me to see uh he said okay my legacy is now in your hands and when he said that to me mm-hmm. i was like i don't want it <laughs> I don't want that responsibility because it's like that is like your your business is your baby. It's your legacy. It's what you're growing and building. And that's when I that's when I I got to a point. I was like, okay, Diana, how how would you want someone? How would you want someone you trust mm-hmm. to run your legacy? How right. would you run your business? How would you? Because I, tell, I told Antonio from day one, I was like, hey, I want to be a business mogul. I want to have multiple businesses, have everyone else in place around them, because I want the freedom to just get up and go. And he was like, okay. And now, and, and you also have to be careful what you put out into the universe. Because the, oh. Un- <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> because the universe will bring to you what you need for what you want in order, and, and this, and in a conversation with myself, these are the things that I, you want to be a business mogul. How can you be a business mogul and not know how you want your business ran? Because you are going to have to be able to trust somebody with your legacy for you to have what you want. And he told him, and in our last meeting, he was like, what do you want? And I, and I, I just broke it down to him. He said, so this is who you need to research. You need to look at Warren Buffett. And I was like, that is crazy. 
because randomly about a few years ago, there was this documentary on Warren Buffett. And at that time, my mindset wasn't on watching things like that. You know, I watched documentaries about certain things, but Warren Buffett, I, there was no connection for me. So a years ago, and, he, and I sat there and I watched it. And I was like, this is interesting. And something in me was like, yeah. I, need to, I need to pay more attention to Mr. Buffett here. And he told me, he said, with what you want to do, you need to study Warren Buffett. And I was like, well, look at that. The universe will bring to you what you need. So me becoming COO, I took it as, okay, if this is what you want, run it how you want your business to be ran because you're going to have to establish that environment right. for right. everyone on your team when you decide that you want that, when you get to that point where you have that freedom that you want. You know, my why that that pulls me when when mm -hmm. I can't move by, by, by myself, what pulls me is the freedom, the freedom to get up and go, the freedom yes. for, you know, me and my entire family to just get up and hop on a plane and go anywhere we want to go. In order to have that freedom, I have to have that trust in order to in order to have someone I trust. I have to build it first. Yes. And yes. And and I, you and you mentioned something that, that is a great segue for, for not only the book, but for, for any company, and that's environment. I build and I keep working on a firm environment that is free from fear, where people can make mistakes. There might be a little blood in the carpet, there might be a little, little tears. It's okay, it squeegees up, it cleans up. Let them fail forward. You've got to give them a, a place where you, there's trust, where they don't fear or they won't perform. And the other thing you said, and it's a huge, you know, believe this or not, here's the universe connecting on this one, is you ask the question how a lot of yourself. That they have found, psychologists have found that asking that question, how do I do this? How can I be this? Is, the, is much better than saying, I will do this. I'm going to do this. That's important. But the most important thing is your brain starts to turn on and find a way and attract those things, as you said, through the universe. How am I going to do this? How would I do that? Huge question. What you're asking, that's a huge, huge question. And that's a great, it's a great takeaway. I, I tell you, the universe, once you learn, <laughs> <laughs> once you truly learn the law of attraction, yep. the universe, you, you're like, okay, wait, let me, let me not put that out there. <laughs> Before the book came out, there was a guy named Earl Nightingale, long, oh, yes. long time ago. And he said, you become what you think about, period. And then he's, you know, the, the whole thing just blew up from there. But you become what you think about. And you do attract those things that you think about. And you bring them into your universe. So be careful about what you're thinking about, what you attract. You can attract some real mm, bad stuff, too. Yes. Yes, you can. And in business, you can also attract your customers. So, so be careful. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I love that. I love that. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> I promise you, when I first, the very first company I ever started was a music artist management firm. And I tell you, I attracted who I was. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. I attracted the divas. I attracted. <laughs> right. And when, when I learned the law of attraction, I was like, That's why. <laughs> yes, exactly. Oh, you got to be careful. You got to be careful. So, Mr. Wittich, I've truly and honestly enjoyed our conversation today. I have one final question for you. And you and I, I always let everyone know, like you said before, there is a success has one language. Prosperity has one language. Abundance has one language. And you've been speaking it this entire time. But I always ask, can you let us know what your, your specifically secret to success has been for you? I think to give without the expectation of a return has always been my, my gift. Because if you think about this, if you give something and you expect a return, that's not a gift. That's not a gift. That's, that's a present with a string. So my secret has always been just to give without the expectation of a return live that life of abundance, did it when I was a little kid, and I've just carried that mindset through. It's just a part of who I am. And I, I, I come at things with an open heart, a loving heart, and when I walk into the door, 
I don't have any prejudice about who that person is sitting there, whether they're going to be an SOB or mean, or they've shut down everybody else. I'm going to give them a chance to be a person, not a concept. That's my, that's my big sister right there. All right, ladies and gentlemen, you heard it straight from Mr. Woodage himself. So if you can please let our audience know, how can they find you? Where can they go to purchase your books? And ladies and gentlemen, if you go on his website, he has trainings available as well. But I'm going to let Mr. Woodage tell you about it. <laughs> it would be, uh, thank you, Fiona. It would be at Bill Woodage, W-O-O-D-I-T-C-H, at Bill Woodage or BillWoodage.com. You'll find all kinds of little goodies up there. Yana, you were a joy. You were fun to talk to. I could just sit down and just keep kicking it around. If you drank wine, I could probably do that with you. But uh, you were fun. <laughs> Thank you so much, Mr. Woodage. Thank you, Secret to Success audience. Have an amazing day. Hey, be safe. I'm not sure if you already know this, but you're already absolutely perfect. You're already absolutely great. And you're already living in massive abundance. The most important things that you have is not what you have. It's not what you do. It's what you know. Because the people who do know what you need to know to leave the middle class, they're in the top 1%. And they control 96% of the world's income. 97% of this world is trading time for money. And that is not the way to become rich. It's not the way to become wealthy. And it is absolutely not the way to leave the middle class. There are 7.8 billion people in the world right now. And they all want to learn how to make money and how to leave the middle class. But the way to become a master at anything is to learn all the rules and then bend them to your favor. Right now in this world, there are 2,057 billionaires, right now. So if you think becoming a billionaire is, a, is a possible, that's 2,057 people that have already proved that impossibility incorrect. And if you think that's crazy, there are 46.8 million millionaires in the world, worldwide right now. Now think about that. 46.8 million millionaires, and that number grows 1,730 millionaires every single day. Money is everywhere. You don't need to max out your credit cards. You don't need to borrow from granddad and grandma. Just look behind me. Look at all the wealth sitting behind me in this junkyard. It's insane how much money is everywhere, and you don't need to go out there and beg, bar, and steal to get it. You just need to know the rules of making money and how to leave the middle class. Essentially, all you need to know is the algorithm of making money, the rules of making money. All you need to know is what to do and how to do it, and you can leave the middle class. Any industry, yoga, golf, underwater basket weaving, clipping fingernails, it doesn't matter. All you have to do is know how to do it, how to get it done, and then find somebody to teach you how to do it, how to get it done, and you will be able to leave the middle class. If you're not getting my point, it's real simple. Whatever you have up here, as long as you understand the rules of leaving the middle class, as long as you understand how to get money, you can take what's up here and get wealthy for what you already have. Right now, the very thing you know up here is already being searched a thousand times a second on Google. Someone right now, actually 1,730 people right now, are gonna become a millionaire from the stuff that you have in your head. Why can't this be you? I mean, it's 1,730 people with your ideas that are no better than you, that are gonna leave the middle class, become a millionaire. Why are you not next? So how do we do this? How do we take what you know and apply it to objective money-making secrets and then allow you to leave the middle class? How do we take you from where you are and let you escape to where you wanna go? So how do we make all this money or take all this knowledge from the Warren Buffers, from Elon Musk, how do we take everything that everyone before you has done and how do we take all of that and then put it in your head so you can leave a legacy for your family. My name is Antonio T. Smith Jr. 32 years ago, I lived in a trash can. That's right, from six to 14, I had no running water, no electricity, no anything, and somehow I'm in the top 1% today. Not because I had the right background, not because I had a silver spoon in my mouth, simply because being homeless made me learn how to make money, 
I retired when I was 29 years old. I'm more than likely younger than you. I'm one of the top 1% income earners in one of the richest countries in the world. What I learned how to do when I was six years old was learn how to generate enough money to eat some cookies so I wouldn't die to death from starvation. From there, I learned how to go from cookies to a meal, from a meal to clothes, to clothes, to shelter, to everything else that supplied my necessary needs. When I was six, I was forced to learn how to make money, and now that's what I'm gonna do and help you do. I've seen amazing results. I have my own economy, I've homeschooled my own children, and I wrote a book that teaches you every single thing that I know about making money, every single thing that other people know about making money, and most importantly, all the stuff that we don't tell you. Because the truth is, and you know it like I know it, the most honest, the most hardworking, unselfish people on planet Earth live in the middle class. Yet, your honesty, your unselfishness, your devout religion going self is not enough to get to the top 1% and that's not fair. The second half of my life has been not about how much money I make, but how I will be remembered from all the money that I have made. And I've been trying to teach everybody how to get out the middle class. I'm the crazy guy famous on the internet for trying to create 100,000 millionaires. I've created eight so far. I got a ninth one on the way, all the way from India. That's pretty cool. And what I want to tell you is something very simple. It's been hard. It's been absolutely hard to help people leave the middle class, not because of the people, because the system would rather keep you being someone else's money instead of you having your own economy and having the money come find and flow to you. It was frustrating because I knew that anybody can make money. And if you knew what I knew, you would change your life. Over the last few years, I built a large following of over half a million people every month that pay me to actually for me to give them advice. Well, that's been exciting for me. And the cool thing is I've created thousands of six-figure earners. I've created millionaires. I've created people who can live their dreams and hold on to their legacies. And now my eyes are on you to create you to what you need to be great. I have been teaching my principles and these principles to hundreds of thousands of people around the world, every country, all continents, and anyone who has taken them seriously, written them down and applied them, have a 100% success rate of leaving the middle class. I've taught these secrets to my following and my inner network, and I've watched them go from four figures to five figures, five figures to six figures, seven figures all the way to eight. Everything that I've ever learned, everything I've ever learned from millionaire mentors, billionaire mentors, and everything I learned from being homeless, and everything that got me into the top 1%, I have placed inside of a book. To date, it is the longest book that I've ever written, the most best book that I've ever written, and that book is called The Richest Man in the Trash Can, and I'm offering it to you today for free. This book is gonna show you how to become wealthy into the top 1% and leave the middle class. This book is gonna give you a step-by-step -step plan if you're 30 years old, all the way to 70 years old, how to get into the top 1%. If you're a teenager, how to get to the top 1%. If you're a millennial, how to get to the top 1%. It's gonna teach you how to make six figures immediately, teach you how to get to a million dollars immediately, and all that good stuff. Plus, I'm gonna give you the 36 objective laws of leaving the middle class. Plus, I'm gonna give you every last one of my secrets that have made me rich. You have to understand that leaving the middle class is the most important fight that you're gonna have in your life. And to be honest with you, it, you can kind of relate to this. It almost takes $450,000 a year just to be broke in America. And that's just in America. If you don't leave the middle class, which is actually an illusion, then you are gonna have a really hard time. Think about it for a second. Some of, most of you are gonna be watching this are gonna be baby boomers, and you've been sold a bad check. They lied to you. Your retirement was not enough for you to live comfortable, and I'm gonna give you this book for free so you can figure out how to triple your retirement and then quadruple your retirement, and then as Grant Cardone would say, 10 extra retirement so you can live the life that's worthy of you. I want you to remember that leaving the middle class is the most important battle that you could ever face in your entire life, especially for your family. So consider this video, this book, your friendly tap on the shoulder. I wanna send you a free copy of this book because I believe that abundance is your birthright. I believe that abundance is freedom. 
and I believe that this book is right for you. In fact, I believe in that so much that I will send you the book for free. All you have to do is cover the cost of shipping. I'll eat the cost, I'll take the loss, and all you have to do is get the book and dominate your reality right now and apply the principles so you can be the best person for your life that is yours. Fill out the form sitting right there to the right. Go ahead, dominate your reality. I can't wait to send you my book. I can't wait to meet you. I can't wait to have you as someone that's been on the journey with me. Antonio T. Smith Jr., you can plant better. You can dominate.